Hello everyone. Thank you for joining. I hope uh, you can hear me. We are going to go for one and a half to two hours depending on the response. And uh, this is getting recorded. The link for video will be shared in Texter's group later. So first of all, let me thank Sanjay Vyas for arranging this session. Always a pleasure to work with him and his team. There's a quick introduction of what I do in case you don't know. Most of you know me already, but just in case. Now I know many of you are infra people, dev people, technical guys. I am not going to talk about either infra or dev, but everything will be from a usage and effective utilization point of view. Of course, you will get a lot of ideas about how to use it yourself or deploy it or program better using the platform. So let's get started. Office is not a new product. It has been there for three decades now, but there is a simple underlying principle. Let me explain that principle first and then we can understand the concept behind these tools in a more effective manner. While I'm doing this, I'm going to shuttle between presentations, so don't worry. So everything which Microsoft does is based on this concept. As you can see, there is some input and there is some output. So we have effort and achievement, right? Now what happens is we are doing this already. Effort, input, output. Ideally, what would you want? You would want less effort and achieve the same thing or same effort and achieve more or even better still, less effort and more impact or more output. Now, of course, in a physical world, if you have to increase the output, you have to increase the input. But in software world, that's the whole idea. Minimum effort and maximum achievement or impact. Now all this is theory. It's very easy for me to do this using animation. But in reality, at least when it comes to office, most of us are here where we are putting a lot of effort and not getting commensurate amount of results, wasting energy and putting manual work. So the idea is every feature which is in my office platform is designed with this principle, minimum effort and maximum impact. Now because all of you are technical people, let me just switch tracks and ask you. You may not be able to answer, but just answer it in your mind. Let's talk about the most commonly used products, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook. There are so many menus, tools, options, and say Excel functions like that. So all those put together, how many features do you think there are? If you count like this, all of them, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, OneNote, only the desktop products I'm talking about. How many features are we talking about? You need not type the answers. I'm just asking you to challenge yourself and think. So probably you will not know the answer. You're not supposed to know the answer, but I'll tell you. There are around 12,000 plus features. How do I know that? Because I have counted. All of you know I have a blog called Efficiency 365. There is an article on how this is done. Of course, I didn't count it manually. There is a command bar collection. And then of course, Excel functions had to be counted differently. So having said that, that number is not very impressive because nobody knows it, but irrespective of what kind of technical person you are, you are using Office somewhere or the other. So ask another question to yourself. How many of these features do you use? And mind you, all of you are technical people, savvy people better than others. But in spite of that, that number typically comes to 100, 150, that kind of thing. So now the question arises. There are thousands of features. A very small portion of it is being used. Does Microsoft know about it? What do you think? Obviously, Microsoft is getting telemetry from every desktop for last 30 years. They know exactly what features or which features are being used. They don't know who is using the features because that data is anonymized, but they know the volume of features being used. So of course they know it. Now the question is, 
why are we not using these features? The answer is these are not really not used. They are not known. So as developers, we go to some programming tool, start a new project, start with a blank canvas and we create features. When it comes to Office, it is not like that. When you start an application, there are already thousands of features. You have to figure out how to use them, so it's a different ball game. So the purpose of today's session is to discuss why people don't use these 12,000. Find the underlying cause and then give you a solution. Not for the world, at least for you individually, and if you like it, I'm sure you'll propagate it to other people around you. So with that in mind, let's see. How many products are there in this thing called Office 365? Probably all of you know it, but just to give you an idea. So I'm just going to start with something which everyone knows. Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook and probably OneNote. But that's not all. Office 365 itself has so many products. And then if you say Microsoft 365, that means Windows plus security. So many more. Now if you show this slide to a typical user, what do you think? They'll be impressed or depressed? Most probably they'll be confused and depressed because multiple thoughts come to mind saying, why do I need all these three so many products? My job is anyway getting done with whatever little Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, which I'm using for decades. So this is not the way to propagate technology. Now when it comes to programming, there are many programming tools and there are programmers, hardcore developers who like those programming languages and they are very enthusiastic about using them effectively. Same thing goes for infra, same thing goes for networking, same thing goes for security. There are people who are specializing in those fields and obviously they are good at it. The problem with Office is nobody is specializing in it even though everyone is using it. So even if you are an IT person and you are using Office or you are a CEO and you are using Office, nobody thinks Office is core to their life. So if you talk to say five successful people and ask them what are the top things which led to your success, nobody is going to say Office. Because in reality, it is not leading to people's success. It's a necessary evil. So this is not the way to position technology and because more all of you are techies, this is one problem. I have been a techie, now I'm not, but this is the problem I noticed much earlier and I've been working on it. Technical people are not able to explain to non-technical users in a simplified manner and probably that is the key. So if you show the platform like this, nobody's going to like it. They will say your IT, you purchased it, your problem, I don't care. So we start with needs. We get a use case, we create a solution. That's what we know. Same thing here. Now Office is used by everyone from a student to chief minister. Doesn't matter, but everyone has different business. Everyone has different requirements, so it's difficult to say exactly how to use Office. So what do we do? We take the least common denominator. Whoever you are, you are going to create some files. You're going to store them somewhere. You're going to execute some work and so on. So these are activities which everyone is doing. As a user may not be doing, you may not be doing automation, but we will come to that. Now, when I have some work to do, there are two ways of getting the work done. One is I do the work myself. Or I will need inputs or help from someone else, in which case I will collaborate with others. So all of these things can potentially be done using one of the two methods. So we have multiple variations here. Now each of these needs, we have a set of products. Most of these products you already know, but I'm just telling you a different way of positioning this. So creation, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, you already know. Sway is a very simple but very effective tool for end users, not for technical guys. Sway allows you to provide the content and creates responsive web pages without programming. The web pages are automatically hosted and you get a URL to share. Simple, effective stuff. Don't talk to IT, create your own web page. Very good for employee communication, emergency management. Many customers are even doing their mini websites, product portfolios, 
urgent announcements and stuff like that. Forms is like Google Forms, Survey Monkey. Now storage, of course, all of us know there is OneDrive. There are many cloud storages. Why OneDrive? We will see as we go along. SharePoint, many of you are already actively working on. Stream is a new thing, nothing new really. Even on Windows NT, on premise, we used to have a free tool called Windows Media Server. Now that has become a part of Azure. It's Windows Media Services. And a component of that you get as a part of Office 365 called Stream. Stream allows you to put video. And once you put video there, assuming it is one of the six supported languages as of now, which includes English, Spanish, French, Japanese, and a couple of others, it automatically created, creates a transcript, and that transcript is also searchable. So basically, it's like an in-house streaming platform. As of now, stream videos cannot be shared outside the organization. The logic being when an organization is putting videos on the intranet, so to say, video intranet, obviously those are going to be confidential videos, training videos, safety videos, product videos. So that's why currently it is limited to sharing inside. And that's the idea, create an LMS kind of portal. For executing work, we have multiple tools. My work is Outlook tasks and shared task list is Planner. For communication, we had multiple options which are now consolidated a bit because Kaizala is getting merged into Teams and Skype is dead being replaced or already replaced actually with Teams. So for communication, we have three of them. Now what happens? For analysis, I'm sure all of you already are using Power BI, so I don't have to explain what Power BI is. It's an adjunct to Excel. It's not a replacement to Excel. And then finally, for automation, automation ideally at an end user level, we have two tools. One is Power Automate, which was called Flow, which now has RPA as well, screen scraping as well, and Power Apps, which is basically sort of an application generator, which is called zero code or low code, where instead of writing long sentences of syntax, you use Excel like functions to create applications from common data sources. So that's the platform. Now this platform has some unique things in it, except for Sway and Forms, everything else works on browser as well, or rather everything else has a mobile app on Android as well as iOS. Why Sway and Forms don't have mobile app? Because they are designed to be browser based. Sway is creating pages, on browser, so obviously it has to be browser based. And forms is used for surveys, so you can't assume any specific infrastructure, so browser based. Otherwise, all these things have a mobile app, and when you get Office 365, you get rights to use those apps as well. I'm not going to go into licensing much, but I will just tell you the difference between the cheaper one and the costlier one. When you go to the cheaper one, it's called E1. By the way, all this put together is called Office 365. Now there are licenses for business and for enterprise. The primary difference is when you go for business licenses, maximum number of users you can host on a tenant is 300. On enterprise, there is no limit. Otherwise, the products are same. In either case, there is a cheaper version and there is a costlier version. It's called E1 and E3 in case of enterprise. The difference is whether you get office on desktop or not. In E3, you get office on desktop. In E1, you only get the browser versions of office. Obviously, office is a costly component, so the E3 is costlier than E1. I don't want to go into pricing. You can go to the website and check it out. Now there is another guy called E5, which includes Power BI and something else. Now, as I said, all these things run on mobile. Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, Teams, OneNote run on desktop as well. Now when they run on desktop, obviously they run on Mac and Windows. And that's why we need Windows. And all these are containing data and we want to protect data. So security obviously is important, not just today, it has always been. And the primary objective of security is not to manage or protect users or devices. We are trying to protect data. 
So in order to do that in an integrated manner, all these things works with EMS or enterprise mobility and security. So all these th things put together is called Microsoft 365. Now, even on a consumer side, Microsoft is rebranding all this as Microsoft 365, but that's a different issue altogether. So having said that, this is the platform. Now I'm going to digress a little and tell you what you are going to get by attending this session. Already 15 minutes down, probably one more hour or so. So what is in it for you? Very important question. So let's see return on investment of you attending this session. Let me take a pause at this point and see if there are any questions. A question where someone is asking what about the F1 inclusions? OK, that was yes, my son. Uh, what about F1? I'm talking about licensing. F1 is called frontline workers, means let's say people who are handling the cash register or in a. Uh, in a McDonald's, for example, people who are actually cooking or the frontline workers or people who are feet on street who are selling insurance. <coughs> sorry. Many of these people don't have. A full fledged presence in email directory or something like that. So. Microsoft created a special SKU or special license, which is cheapest license, even less than E1, which is for frontline workers. That does contain browser versions of some products and it is containing some extra things like shift management, bookings and stuff like that. Is there any other question? There is one more question. Uh, some uh, Ambarish is asking, has the virtual background been rolled out into Microsoft Teams yet? Yes, that's a good question. Yes, uh, just few days back virtual background has been added and uh, if you go to app data Microsoft Teams backgrounds, you can upload your pictures as well. Now while we are talking about virtual background, I'm sure all of you use those. There is one common mistake we do while using virtual backgrounds. Either there are standard pictures or we upload our own pictures. In either case, the mistake is background is a picture. So all backgrounds are going to be pictures. Now because they are pictures, they are sharp. And ideally if it is a background picture, it should be blurred. So before you put a picture as a background, go to some tool PowerPoint, for example, or whatever tool you have, blur it and then save it. That gives a better, more professional look to your virtual backgrounds. All right, so let's come back. There was a clarification to the previous question. They wanted to know which apps are not included in the F1 if possible. And another person has asked what happened to Microsoft Access. All right, so F1, uh, the comparison it's best to go to the website and see. About Access, it is very much there. If there is no web version of Access, Access and Publisher are the only ones which work only on desktop and Mac. So. If you have Office 365 E3, then by all means you get access as well. All right, so this is the benefit of attending my session. If you use Office, you will save at least 20 minutes a day. I will help you reduce your eye strain. That's a very easy thing to do. And then we will improve your collaboration, execution, analysis. Let's see how much time permits. Eye strain is the simplest of the lot, so let me show you that quickly. All of you already know that Visual Studio Code or Adobe products, we spend a lot of time working on them. Same way people spend a lot of time working on Office. And by default, what happens is the Office, if you go to options, the default option unfortunately is white theme. Because of it, what happens? Too much of white color is hitting your eyes. So the simplest of best practices, go to file options, and choose dark gray. So now it makes it look like much more elegant, reduces eye strain, and once you change it in either Word or Excel, it will change it for all of his products. Now if you are an infra guy, of course this is a group policy setting, or if you are using 
as you ready. Of course, this is available in endpoint manager as well. So that reduces your eye strain. Now, in order to improve your life in general, I'll have to digress a little and then we will come back to this. I know some of you are working as independent consultants, some of you are freelancers, some of you are um, working in companies, some of you have your own companies, all kinds of things. But let me tell you something. Irrespective of who you are, everyone has some kind of a job description. Even if you are a one person show working on your own, you have some kind of job description for yourself. So let's assume you have a job description. Now, how often do we look at the job description? Typically during review. So I'm going to do an accelerated review to show you what happens. So this is my job description. I'm going to go and do a review. So now I'm going to sit with my boss and do an accelerated review. Boss is asking me, have you done this? I said yes, no, no, yes, partially, yes, no, something like that. So I just did a simulated fast review. Question is, have you ever seen a perfect review where everything which was in the JD was completely delivered? Think about it. Most probably the answer is no. Now there is one common thought which all of you have irrespective of who you are, what is your role, what is your current status? Everyone wants to grow, so that's an underlying ambition everyone has. Now look at this review. Every review there is something missing. Now when you do a review, there are only three options available. Either you do less than what you promised in JD equal to or greater than. Obviously, if you deliver less, you are not going to grow. If you deliver more, you are going to grow. We know that, but we are here. We are below and we want to go above. That's a problem. So how do we do that? That gap is where inefficiency comes into picture and if you bridge the gap, it increases the chances of your growth. So whatever I'm telling you, if you use it effectively in your context, it will lead to your growth. So let's see how that is done. One of the simplest things is all of you use some email. Now issue is I have not exceeded my JD. Why is that? Because let's assume all of you are talented. You have the related expertise, experience, everything, everything. Still you're not able. Why not? What is the shortage? Typically, even if everything else is there, there is shortage of one thing which is time and time cannot be controlled by you. So that is the problem. So if that is the problem, what should we do? We should use time very nicely and intelligently. Now even in today's world, everyone opens Outlook every day. First app opened at least at user level is Outlook when you come to office. Nowadays we go, don't go to office, but still sitting in the morning, open the laptop Outlook. Now where do we go on Outlook? Inbox and calendar. What do we do there? In inbox, for example, only two possibilities. You send a mail or you reply to a mail. Of course, there is a third possibility. You don't look at a mail, but that doesn't take time. So remember you have shortage of time. So if you want to send a mail, that is you doing your work. If you reply to someone's mail, you are helping them do their work. Fair enough. The problem which is not fair is the proportion. It's always against you because it's you versus rest of the world. You are going to reply to more mails. So same concept applies to calendar as well. You are meeting your work, others meeting others work always against you. Now look at it. You have shortage of time. You are not able to exceed your JD and whatever time you have, you are wasting helping others. That is really stupid. That is called inefficient. So how do we solve this problem? Very simple. We should focus on our work first and then help others. I am not saying don't help others. If you don't help others, they will not help you, but not at the cost of your work. So now the question is, where is my pending work? Obviously, you have that list somewhere. Unfortunately, it's scattered. Whoever likes whichever tool or whatever is available at that point of time, we use randomly and create multiple task list. <coughs> in fact, the biggest chunk is in mind. Now, when do we actually get our work done between meetings? So let's say I come out of a meeting. I have half an hour. I want to decide what to do now. 
what should I do now? I want to find the best use of uh, that half an hour, but my task list is scattered. Because it is scattered, I can't sort, filter, prioritize. So what do I do? I go to the least common denominator which I can access fastest, which is mind. What does that mean? All talented, ambitious people who have only one problem, shortage of time. When it comes to deciding what to do with that time, we do whatever comes to our mind. That is called inefficiency. So what is the logic? Because of this inefficiency, which nobody talks about, we are not utilizing our time properly and we are not executing our work on time and efficiently. So problem is work listed too many places. Solution is simple. Keep it in one place. That place unfortunately is the tasks folder in Outlook. Why am I saying unfortunately? Because that folder has been there for years. Nobody uses it properly. Some people may put some tasks, but that's not the only place. So it's a very, very simple two step process which you have to follow. Step one, start using the task folder religiously. Wherever a work originates, whether someone calls you on WhatsApp, on Telegram, I get a mail, doesn't matter where the work originates, just put it in the task folder. That's step number one. So at least you have a master list and of course monitor that list. The second step is to find time to do that work. How do you do that? Step two is open the calendar in a separate window and drag drop the important tasks, at least time consuming tasks and block time because unless you block time, someone else will call you for a meeting. If the calendar is blocked, the chances of people calling you for a meeting are reduced, not eliminated, but still better. So two step process, create a master list, drag drop, block time, and then you're managing things better. So what did I just do? I created a task, yes, and I created a task or rather I created an appointment with myself to do my own work. I know that sounds funny, but this is called time management. Now that the. Now that the. Oh, because you are technical people, you're going to ask me this question. Let me ask you or answer that question before someone asks it. Um, yes, questions which I've already answered, just uh, like them so that I know visually which questions are answered. Done, done. So, by default, calendar entry has a reminder. By default, tasks don't have a reminder for the simple reason. Of course, you can enable reminders, but think like a techie. If Microsoft changed the default to no reminders, they must have had a reason for it. The reason being when you put a task, you put the deadline. Deadline means the last date of doing the task. Do you want to be reminded on that day? No. So that's why I said when you drag drop the task into calendar, now it is a calendar entry. You will get reminder for that. All right, so now that tasks have become important in your life, what do you want? You want tasks to be visible to you all the time. Now when you go to inbox and calendar, you have to remember there is one more guy which you have never looked at, but now it has suddenly become important to you in your life. Inbox can have your work, others work. Calendar can have your work, others work. Task is 100% my work, so change your mindset. Task is the most important folder in your life. The folder was always there, but you never looked at it. Now suddenly you have understood your importance and your mindset has changed. So when your mindset changes, that's called digital transformation. Now we have a different thing. I have this thing called tasks, which has suddenly become important in my life. Very good. But now when you go to mobile app on Outlook, what happens? You don't see the task folder or many of you may be using the native tasks app, whatever Android, iOS, wherever. In that, you don't see the task folder from Outlook. Even Outlook mobile app does not show you the task folder. So what do you do? That is why you install a special app called To Do. If you have not done that, you can actually do it right now. So this gives you Outlook tasks visible on your mobile. Alright, 
I was just checking for an answered question. So if you have not done that, put the to do app. We'll come back to to do app a little later because this has more features than what I have mentioned just now. All right, now having said that, um, let's go to other products and see how to use them. Before we do that, many of you are already using many of these products. So how do you know what I'm doing is efficient or not? So let me give you some simple guidance on that. The question is, have you ever done any kind of survey or audit about how people use Office? Most probably not. We do process reengineering, optimization, Six Sigma, Lean, all kinds of things for all other business processes except Office. So let's see how much time do we spend using Office every day. Two types of work we do, core work, which is your primary domain, and using Office, which is Office work. Let's assume for argument's sake it is 50-50. Maybe a different proportion doesn't matter. Now core work you are already good at, so as much as possible we try to optimize it using different methods. And we don't stop at one time, we continuously improve it. Unfortunately, when it comes to office, everything is ad hoc. Nobody has checked. As long as the work is done, nobody cares how it is done. That's why it is inefficient. So how do you know what you are doing is efficient or inefficient? That's the next topic. So let me show you that. So I'll give you three simple, really simple principles of detecting inefficiency. I won't show you demos. You are smart enough to figure it out, but uh, let me just explain that live. So here are the three methods of detecting inefficiency. While you are working, you have to check. Am I doing something repetitively? For example, dragging formulas, copying, pasting, copying, pasting, stuff like that. If I'm doing something repetitively, every kind of repetition is not wrong, by the way. Repetition is the crux of business. If you are in, let's say BPO, you are running a call center. Every call you get, you follow the same process. It's repetitive. You are in manufacturing. You are producing same kind of item again and again. That's repetitive. That's not a problem. If repetition does not lead to revenue, then it is inefficient. The second is hands or brain. So if you are, let's say, copying a formula, I have some 5000 rows. I have put a formula in Excel. I want to copy it. How will you do it? Three methods. Either you will drag it or you will copy paste or you will double click. So let's say you decide to drag. How long will you drag depending on the amount of data? Now while dragging, you have to think. Which part of my body is being used? Hands or brain? Hands use brain idle means inefficient. Simple method of detecting efficiency at individual level. And the third one is who is helping whom? If time permits, I'll give you a demo. Or oh, let me try to give you a demo right now, but never mind. These are the three methods by which you can detect inefficiency. Having said that, you will start noticing that you are inefficient in many different places. So how do we find the correct way? That is the whole idea of today's session. I can't cover all the tools, all the features, but I can help you in two ways. Help you detect your inefficiency and help you find the right way. Unfortunately, the method we use to find a way when we are stuck are also inefficient. Typically, if you don't know how to do something, what will you do? You will ask someone, Google it or go to help. None of those methods work typically, at least in the context of office, because if you ask someone, that's a bad idea because everyone is inefficient. You will get another variation of inefficiency. When you go to Google, you just type some random tips and tricks kind of question. Whatever is written is also written by inefficient people. We never scroll to the second half of the page also. Whatever comes on top, we get it. The question is, did you ask what is the best way of doing it? No, so you're not going to get the best way. You're going to get one of the ways. And help is useless because unless you know the name of the feature, you can't go to help. So the simplest way of learning I will show you as a part of next demos. 
So let me open a file to explain these concepts. This is a very simple demo for a high end technical audience, but never mind. You'll get the idea. OK, let me open the file. I'm using a dual monitor. I'm not very used to dual monitor nowadays because I'm always on stage and the projector is behind me, so I can't really use a dual monitor setup, but never mind. So here is a simple demo. I have an Excel. With many rows, I want to copy a formula. What do I do? I put some formula and then I drag. Obviously it's going to take time. It's going to be hands versus brain. Now you are smart. I'm sure you use double click. Double click doesn't take time, but that's dangerous. If there's a gap, it's going to stop. Many of you write macros. You struggle to find the end point of the data all the time. Now that I have found it, I'll have to bridge the gap and then again double click. Now probably there is one more. So now I do it five times. I will realize this is also irritating. This is also repetitive and hangs or brain. So what is the root cause? The root cause here is neither do I know nor Excel knows where the data ends. So find the end point control end sometimes works. Now that you have found the end point, select it upwards. Now selection is temporary. You make it permanent by inserting a table. Once you create a table. Life is good. Now this is permanent selection. Our problem was with gaps, so let me put gaps. I will still put the same formula exactly the way I did before, but this time there is table. So now earlier what I was doing, I was helping Excel. Now Excel will help me. You never have to check whether it reached the bottom. It will always go to the bottom. There's just a very simple feature added in Excel in 2007. Nobody uses it by default. It transforms the way you work on Excel completely. I am in fact about to release a video on that today at night. I will release that. It's a half an hour video on 13 benefits of using Excel tables. Now mind this is an example of how every feature is designed to make our life easier, but we don't end up making our life easier because not because we are dumb, not because we want to be inefficient because we found some method long back. That method is still working because of backward compatibility, but Microsoft added more features. We never kept pace with it. That is why we are inefficient. On day one, we are efficient. Now it may be the worst way of doing it. That's the problem with a feature rich product. Not just office, any feature rich product has the same issues. So let's go further. Let's look at other components from. Other components. From the office toolkit. Let me switch PPTs. So OneDrive, probably many of you are using, but I work with so many customers there. Everyone has OneDrive, but when it comes to using OneDrive, the usage is not going up. So many of you probably have Office 365, and if you go to the usage dashboard, you will notice the consumption is not going up. The reason is deploying products doesn't mean they are used properly. In spite of having OneDrive, which is one terabyte of space, the most popular place for storing files at end user level at least is desktop, which is pitiable. Now as IT, if you want to tell people why you should use OneDrive, you will just go do a small demo. Say we have got OneDrive, we have spent for it, use it. People say OK, when I feel like I'm using it, but it doesn't really work. So the problem is how to communicate the benefits of the technology to people is an art in itself. It's not difficult, but it has to be done in the right way. Never show features first. Always show problem, then establish the problem. Prove to people that they have that problem and because they have that problem, they are pitiably inefficient and then say, oh, there is a solution and then leave it at that. People don't want to call themselves inefficient and they don't want to be proven that they're stupid. So once they realize they have been stupid because they did not use the feature, there is automatic urge to use it. It's compelling. There is no force involved. So quickly, how to talk about OneDrive? Of course, I know all of you know what is OneDrive, but I'm showing you how to position it. 
So don't talk about one, right? So you store files on desktop C colon D colon. Never mind. What can go wrong? Hard disk can fail. Obviously, you don't have backup. If your machine is off, you're stuck to PC. You can't get your file when you are far away. And most importantly, you create too many copies of the file because you'll need inputs from someone. You send a CC with attachments. They reply. Now you have to copy paste, copy paste 20 times. Create another one. One more round required. No problem. I have a lot of time. I'm getting salary for copy paste done. After 27 copies, we are done. Is this efficient? No, even a child will tell you this is not efficient. It is absolutely inefficient, but we call it teamwork. That's the biggest joke. So problem. Never mind. Everyone knows this. Nothing new. What is the problem? Root cause. Root cause is file is going to people. Obviously. Copies will get created. Solution is also simple enough. Keep it in one place. Let people come to the file. But we tried that with file shares. File shares one person edits, other person gets locked because Windows blocks it. Now what? People have given up on that. So that is why Microsoft solved that problem by creating one place. One person, one place, always one copy. No need to make a second copy. And of course, one terabyte. By the way, now it's not one TB. For enterprise editions, it is one TB minimum and unlimited potentially. You can request Microsoft to extend it up to 5 TB of no extra payment. <coughs> Even in business. So because one person, one place, one copy, one TV. When I put a file on one drive, how many people can see it? That is one problem people always have at the back of the mind. They may not ask you because they think this IT guy wants to spy on my files. That's why they're asking me to put on one drive. They don't realize that anyway IT can spy on them, but never mind. So when I store a file on one drive by default, only one person can see it. So one person, one place, one copy, only one person can see it. That is why it is called OneDrive. That is how you position the products. And of course, depending on the time available, you show demos. I'm not going to show you demos, but after showing demos, even during demos, you have to do the same approach. For example, telling people to send links is not enough. You have to tell them if you don't send links, what happens? I already showed you one problem. Too many copies. So how do you position that? CCs with attachments is your enemy. It is taking away precious time from your life. So you say next time you put a file and trouble yourself, this guy will catch you like that. Now there are simple but effective things which you can talk to people about, which will compel them to look at these things seriously. For example, I am sure all of you have suffered because of this. You send a mail attached file, sent it to 20 people, then noticed a mistake. Nothing can be done. Recall, recall never works. In fact, whether it worked or not, also we don't know. Then you send another mail. Usually nobody reads your mail, but this one everyone has finished reading and then people get confused. Now the moment you start sending links, this is never going to happen because you can change the data or file after sending the link. So simple but effective things. So like that, one by one, you tell people about how this works. So to cut a long story short, by using OneDrive, what is the extra effort? By the way, when you go to File Save As, instead of clicking on PC, you're clicking on OneDrive. So not even a single extra click. But by virtue of putting it on OneDrive, you get 12 benefits. I'm not going to read out all these benefits. Just read them. If any of you have questions, I'm going to take a pause now and take questions. There are two there questions are two. from earlier, not right now. Uh, one is to do has shared list. Can we show those in Outlook? And the next question is also similar, so I'm just combining the two. Outlook has a default to do list and we have tasks folder for each mailbox. How can we make tasks for a specific mailbox as default? All right, so one more question has come, which I shall take once you've answered these. Sure, so to do list. 
is by default going to show you what is in Outlook folder. Now there is a confusion to do app also shows you shared task list which are created in planner. Now in Outlook when you click on the. Tasks icon you also get some folder called to do that has nothing to do with the to do app per se that to do folder in Outlook is basically a search folder which shows you all the flagged emails across all mailboxes or across all the mails in that particular mailbox specifically. Even that to do folder is shown on the to do app. So to do app shows you the task folder. It shows you the to do folder from Outlook and it shows you shared task list from planner. Now to answer the other question Outlook. Default to do list is mailbox specific. It is not across mailboxes. So same thing is for tasks. Now Abhishek Kant, hi Abhishek, how are you man? Is the editing experience embeddable in a custom program or HTML? Uh, which product are you talking about? I am. Is it Sway? Abhishek? Uh, yes, Ambrish has a question. Is there a way to upgrade from Office 365 home to one of the Office business plans? Yes, of course. You just change the subscription, it will automatically get upgraded. The next one is uh, how is it solved when multiple edits at the same time in OneDrive? Yeah, that's a very good question. So let me just show you one slide. So if multiple people are editing together, that's one of the very, very sophisticated benefits and programmatic programmatically. It's a very complex thing to implement given the huge number of features which Office has. All the features work on desktop version with multiple people editing simultaneously. Of course, Google also does that, but Google doesn't have a desktop feature each version, so technically it's very complex. So if there is a conflict, what happens? What happens depends from product to product. In case of Excel, Excel is not just individual items. I may change one cell, but it may have thousand formulas dependent on it. So in Excel, if two people type in the same cell, the person to press enter last wins. There is no conflict possible in Excel. In case of Word and PowerPoint, there can be a conflict like this. For example, multiple people are editing. There was a shape which was yellow. Someone made it green, someone made it pink, whatever. Now what does PowerPoint do? PowerPoint can't decide which one to keep. So the owner gets a message. It's a proper well-defined conflict resolution ribbon and a dialogue which can potentially have multiple conflicts. So there is a previous next and the owner can decide which changes to keep. This works in Word as well. Similarly, conflicts can happen when some person is editing online, some person is editing offline. So when the offline changes are synced, Word or PowerPoint may realize that there is a conflict. Again, in that case, similar conflict resolution dialogues will appear. All right, next question. Next question is uh, Abhishek has clarified that he was talking about OneDrive Word files. Yeah, so OneDrive, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, all of them can be shared online purely on browser. Absolutely no problem. And they are embeddable, yes. Uh, next question is, can we have a local copy auto synced with OneDrive? This will be useful in case internet connection is lost. Absolutely, so this is one of the features which you must explicitly explain to users when you are talking about OneDrive because people are saying what is OneDrive? It is on cloud. I am used to having my files with me all the time. Now I put the file on cloud. I don't have internet. I don't have access to my own file. That's unfair. That's not obviously the way it happens. So you actually show a demo, save the file to OneDrive, ask everyone where is the file saved, then laugh at them, say you are stupid, go to your local file folder and show that the file is first stored locally and then it gets synced. So by all means, by default, with no extra configuration, all local files are first stored locally, even if you store them on OneDrive. And they are auto synced. 
Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, there is a question uh, asking will the to do app work for any exchange account? To do app will work for any exchange online account, not on premise. OK, and there's one more. Sometimes OneDrive asks me to add desktop files to sync. Yes, so that's a feature because what happened is IT deployed OneDrive and uh, after that they went and saw how many files are in OneDrive and there is one file in OneDrive called test.doc. That's a joke. Why that happened? Because nobody put files on OneDrive. Why? Because they didn't know OneDrive is so useful. Why? Because IT didn't tell them. So in order to cut the crap and simplify that process, if IT is not efficient enough or capable enough of convincing users, Microsoft said what can be done? So let's say where are the files? Half of them are on desktop, which is stupid, but still and my documents. So they created a feature called known folder move. This can be configured through SCCM group policy also or endpoint manager and it can be a silent feature. So without talking to anybody, you can say anything which is on desktop or my documents automatically becomes part of OneDrive. So if you have files on my documents or desktop and OneDrive is asking you, then just say yes, life will be better. No more questions as of now. All right, great. So, so far so good. Now, giving knowledge is one part of the story. In spite of having this knowledge, people may not use the product effectively, even if they are convinced because habit wins over efficiency. So in order to give the second level push, you have to do something else. And that is something never done when we are deploying tools or technologies in large scale users. I'm sure you as developers face this problem as well. You spend so much time, energy, money, effort creating great products. One year down the line, you go and see there is underutilization and misuse. Why did that happen? Because we did not communicate the features. Maybe you did, but people changed or there was no compulsion to use them. So you need to create a not a forced thing, but sort of a compulsion that is called creating standard operating procedures. Especially manufacturing finance kind of companies have all kinds of standard operating procedures for every small little business activity. So why not do it for office? So having given knowledge about all this. Now we have to create a standard operating procedure saying at least all new files. What is your excuse for putting it on a local drive? Every file is like your baby. You want to pamper your baby or you want to trouble your ba baby. There's no logical reason why you would want to put it on local drive, so please put them on one drive. There are some old files. Don't put all of them on one drive. No need, but at least active files and folders also deserve to go on one drive. And by the way, when you are putting a file from local to one drive, don't copy it, move it because if you copy it, there will be two copies, one synced, one not synced. You will get confused. Now, having created standard operating procedures, who is going to distribute those to thousands of users or hundreds of users? You don't do it because IT tells people don't listen. HR tells people don't listen. You teach this to bosses and prove to bosses that because people are not using this, they are paying salary to thousands of inefficient people. So if boss wants to grow business, they need those people to not waste that time. So boss should send the SOP. So if boss sends the SOP and says tomorrow onwards, I'm not going to address attachments at all, then life is good. Another bottleneck in all this is IT itself. For example, OneDrive being so nice, there is a problem. OneDrive, you share the link. Everyone knows that any cloud storage, you share the link. But IT is smart, so they say no, no, no. Sharing is OK, but sharing to external parties we have disabled. Why have we disabled? Oh, because that's a security risk. Now you have to tell IT that external sharing being enabled is not a security risk. In fact, not enabling it is a security risk. Why is that so? 
why are they saying it is risk? Because they are saying no, no files are corporate data and anybody can send the link to anybody else. Oh, that is insecure, right? So for last 30 years, if I had to send a file to someone outside, how would I send that? I will attach the file to email. So are you telling me for last 30 years you're auditing every email attachment which went outside? Seriously, nobody is doing that. So don't don't talk crap. CCs with attachments is insecure. It has been insecure for decades. Why? Why nobody talks about it? Because we just got used to it. Like so many other inefficiencies, we got used to this one also. Why we are talking about this one? Because it's new. So let's talk about it. So let me show you. If you enable external sharing, what are the benefits? And then for each benefit, you think in your mind, would this benefit be applicable to email attachments? So first and foremost, when you share the link, file is not going anywhere. When it's an attachment, once it goes outside, you have no control. You don't know what happened to the file. Now, if it's an external email ID, there is an extra OTP which will be generated, which means there is proof of ownership of that email ID, which is never there for email attachment. Of course, you can block download. So while sharing, you have a choice of whether to allow editing. If you say no editing, you can block download. Then the file will only open on browser. Copy paste will be disabled. Screenshot can still be taken, but there is no technology for that in any window. So leave that aside. Latest version is always available. Very often people use the wrong price list and stuff like that. That will never happen. Can stop sharing anytime in case there is a problem or it's time bound. You can actually have automatic expiry set by IT. And more importantly, you get an audit trail. So if you send a link to someone outside, that someone sends it to your competitor, that person doesn't know that you know that that person forwarded it. So it's actually going to make you more alert than more insecure. So that is why you should enable external sharing for OneDrive, SharePoint and Teams. Now I'm not saying 100% of attachments are eliminated. Some may be regularly or genuinely required like legal documents, RFPs, pay slips. By all means send attachments when required, but otherwise 80%, 90% now become efficient with links. So that is how you propagate the benefits and even IT needs to be educated because office is something they don't get properly because it's an end user tool. So now let's move to teams because many of you have been asking questions on teams. I saw in the text group plus I get a lot of questions from teams for from users as well, customers as well. Many customers are still on Skype. People are using Zoom. People are using WhatsApp, Telegram, all kinds of things. So let's move to Teams. Let's see if there's any question quickly. Uh, there is one question. If you have access to multiple subscriptions, can you sync different folders to different O365 accounts? Absolutely, that's a very good question. So you can have multiple personal as well as corporate accounts mapped on one drive. ZS mute yourself. And each one will be a separate folder. Same thing on mobile app as well. And if you use mobile device management or mobile application management, MD or MM, then you can also enforce in such a way that you can't copy a file from one tenant to another or from corporate to personal and so on. So it's very well entrenched and integrated with the security stack. If time permits, we'll talk about the security part of it as well. But let's move to Teams. Now, there are three questions which are linked in okay. a way and it's related to OneDrive. If I delete the files from desktop, will it delete in OneDrive? Similarly, the next question is if I sync desktop files onto OneDrive, can we just delete the local folder in OneDrive? All right. So let me address these questions before we move to teams because these are related questions. So what was the first question? Can I? Can we delete files from the desktop? Will it get deleted in OneDrive? Yeah, so yes, it will get deleted from OneDrive because they are synced. So because they are synced, not only from desktop, 
whether you delete it from desktop or another device, the file will get deleted from all synced devices. Now that sounds dangerous, but it is not because OneDrive is available on browser and like a desktop, OneDrive has its own OneDrive has its own recycle bin and those files are kept there for 90 days. IT can increase that duration as well. Finally, behind the scenes OneDrive is SharePoint, so everything which is applicable to SharePoint applies there. Now while we are talking about that, let me talk about a related thing. What happens if there is a ransomware attack? Because what is going to happen in a ransomware attack? My files on the desktop are going to get encrypted. Then what happens to my files on OneDrive? Obviously, they will also get encrypted. Then what's the point? The point is OneDrive is SharePoint. And because of that, what happens? Every file when you change, there is a version. So when you go to OneDrive, it gives you a nice little feature called restore your OneDrive. It shows you a chart of how many files were synced on a daily basis. You may have thousands of files on OneDrive, but you're not editing all the thousands of files in OneDrive every day. So if there is a ransomware attack, you will see a peak. So what you do is you don't have to go to each file and manually restore it to previous version. Obviously the ransomware encrypts it that creates a new version. Previous one is there. So you just drag this to the previous day and in one stroke, everything will be done. That's how it works. Now, of course, doing this slider is a manual process. Probably IT or someone in security will do it. You can educate users to do it also. But if this has to be done at enterprise level, someone in help desk is going to do this dragging of that uh, progress bar or that slider thousand users thousand times. That's not very efficient. So what do we do? So that is where Microsoft security stack comes into picture. So if you have Microsoft security stack and advanced threat protection ATP as it is called, which is a part of E5, then ATP detects the ransomware attack on the desktop, talks to OneDrive directly without any IT or security guy coming into picture. User doesn't even come to know there was a ransomware attack and all the files are auto restored. Is that nice? Now to answer the other question, which is about uh, files. So what happens for files is of course OneDrive has one terabyte space and we have less space. Laptops are becoming thinner. Many of you are using tablets and so on and so forth. So what happens when you have files which are many or large number of files on OneDrive, but you don't want to keep all of them on local drive. So what happens then is there is a feature called in files on demand. So if you right click on a file, you can choose free up space option in which case the icon will change to cloud. What does that mean? It's basically like a shortcut, but it's better than a shortcut because it will give you file preview. The file and the content of the file will appear in search, but the file is on cloud. So for these cloud files, they are not occupying space locally, so you can optimize active folders, active projects you keep always on this device. When the project is done, you still want access to it. You save free up space, so best of both worlds. This means sync. This means cloud only. This means sync locally. This means I have explicitly said keep this on device. Files on demand. All right, now let's move to Teams. There has been a lot of discussion about Teams versus WhatsApp versus Zoom and all that basically because of Corona. But even otherwise, there has been a lot of discussion. One of the discussion is already Microsoft has Skype. Why waste time and create another one and so on and so forth. Agree. We will handle all those. Now, first of all, remember Teams is not just chat. Teams does have chat and we will compare that chat with other chats, but there is more. So Teams is actually replacing six kind of tools. Please understand that clearly. One is email that may be surprising. We will talk about how Teams replaces email later. Then phone of course. Because there's audio call video call chat. 
file shares and proper professional audio video conferencing as well. So all these plus what you are attending right now. This is a live event. This is not a meeting. <coughs> Sorry, the difference between a meeting and streaming is meeting has a limit of 250 and it's two way, so anybody can share screen. Anybody can see audio video of each other, whereas in streaming, as you can see, whatever I'm talking and showing, you can see the only method of interacting is the q &A. Now you will remember that many of you may be streaming your live webcast and you may have used other tools, YouTube, Facebook Live, Xplit, OBS, whatever. Teams streaming gives you up to 10,000 users. It's not perfect, of course, but it is the simplest in terms of configuration and delivering provided the bandwidth is good. In today's world, the bandwidth is suffering, so it does have a problem, but that applies to all kinds of streaming. So streaming allows you up to 10,000 people. And how much do you have to pay for that subscription? 125 rupees per month. So 250 people, 1,000, 10,000 people for broadcast, and you get one TV space. Anyway, so all these are now being replaced with one tool called Teams. So let's go one by one and see how this guy does it. Now, what does what? So Teams has multiple tools inside. So let's go to that one by one. So I'm going to talk about chat first, and there is a lot of discussion about Skype versus Skype for business because many customers have Skype and they also have Teams because IT doesn't have the guts to stop Skype and say now onwards Teams. Why not? Because IT themselves are not convinced. Why should they use it? How will they convince users? So let's talk about Skype for business for the time being. I'm not going to read out the whole table. Those who are using Skype for business will understand the problems. I'm just talking about simple chat and simple meeting right now. So what happens here? Chat transcripts are typically in Outlook, which nobody finds it easy to search. Whereas here chat transcripts are built in. Multiple transcripts are not created for one person, one person, one chat transcript, but like any other chat software. And the audio video quality is amazing, given at least base bandwidth. Streaming requires higher bandwidth for the presenter, not for the audience, but meetings require lesser bandwidth. I have done meetings where I could present my PPT from my mobile while I was in a car and it has worked beautifully. So that is the difference. Now when it comes to WhatsApp or some other tools, let's compare that as well. Now all of you know you're all technical people. Security is a problem. If Jeff Bezos could be hacked, we will definitely be hacked. Don't you think Jeff Bezos has a good security team to protect him? It was not that. The platform called WhatsApp is not designed with corporate security in mind. By all means, for personal work, you use whatever you like. For corporate work, you must use something which is designed with all the security and compliance in mind. Why? Because that data you want to protect. Data is an asset and a liability. If you use it properly, it's an asset. If it leaks out, it's a liability. Whether you are in India or other countries now for data leakage, the penalty is 4% of your global turnover for every instance of data leakage. So that effort or that risk is not worth taking it. Now you will say if data leaks because I put something in WhatsApp, it's company data, company will pay 4%. Yes, but they are going to investigate who leaked the data. So you will also be penalized. So it's personal risk as well. Now Teams is designed with compliance in mind. If I time permits, I will show you the compliance portal, but just trust me, compliance is a very complicated thing. To make a product compliant, you have to go through hundreds of pages of legal documents, convert them to technical things and manage them on an ongoing basis. Just by virtue of the fact that your data is on OneDrive and Teams, 50% of compliance is already managed by Microsoft. Why? They are not doing you a favor because your data is their customer's data. So even if you are not bothered about your data by putting it on WhatsApp, if Microsoft leaks your data, 
Microsoft's 4% turnover is going. So they have millions of customers of data. So implicitly they are going to protect it better than anybody else will. That is why you are getting benefits of security and compliance. Now in WhatsApp, there is another issue, legal evidence. So you ask your boss, should I give 20% discount on WhatsApp? Boss says, OK, go ahead. You're not going to listen. You're going to say. Send me a mail. Because mail is legal evidence, whereas in Teams, Teams chat is also legal evidence because it is archived like exchange archive is done. Exactly for the same period of time, there is full fledged retention and record management. There is a workflow associated with deletion as well. There are legal holds. Everything you want from a enterprise class. Compliance and e discovery system is automatically built in the moment you use Teams chat. So even if it has the convenience of a chat, it has all the benefits of an enterprise wide data management system. I may not have time to talk about a demo of it, so I'm going to talk about it now. There is another concept called DLP, data loss prevention. Many customers have different third party tools for that. Many don't know that Microsoft has a fully ingrained DLP system and that DLP works with teams as well. So if I have a sensitive data type, for example, other card, credit card, my internal customer ID, if I type that in a chat, even that can be caught by DLP and DLP can prevent that. Third party solutions don't understand Microsoft products well enough, so DLP solutions suffer. Now let's switch tracks and see what else this does. You will notice that uh, Teams has two things. It's a dual kind of personality. Why am I saying that? Because chat is chat that is for ad hoc work. But Teams is also designed for something else which is called teamwork. Now when it comes to chat, it has all the features of regular chat. It has memes, it has customizable memes. In fact, simple thing like file sent. I sent a file to someone. Where do you find it? In WhatsApp, you'll have to scroll up, up, up because the files get archived. In Skype, you can't find it at all properly. In Teams, there is a separate tab for files. And if I share a file with you, on chat, where does it go? It goes to OneDrive. That is the integration part. So you get all the benefits of OneDrive plus the benefit of Teams chat. So like that, these products grow on you. They are not designed in pockets. They are designed to work in an integrated manner. Now let's look at the other aspect of Teams, which is teamwork. Now there again, you know the history. Microsoft wanted to buy Slack and that didn't happen, so Microsoft created Teams, but Microsoft also had Skype. Why did they kill it? They killed it because Teams is designed for cloud and mobile kind of infrastructure. Skype was designed 10, 12 years back for on-premise infrastructure with only VPN, only intranet kind of setup. I'm sure you have tried so many Skype meetings. Half the time audio doesn't work, video doesn't work, firewall ports to be opened, bad quality. Teams is designed with the assumption that people are mobile, bandwidths are less, everything is on cloud. They could not patch up Skype to bring to this level, so they rewrote a superset of Skype. That is why Microsoft is confidently telling you to chunk, junk Skype and move to Teams, and they have given you a very smooth coexistence as well as cutoff path. So the other part of teams is teamwork, but let's see what really teamwork means. So teamwork means a project, a formal project. I have a team of 15 people. We have to execute some project in let's say three months. These people are on different departments, sitting in different places and today sitting at home. Doesn't matter. Now these people need to know what each other is doing. There is a plan. Someone made an Excel file, sent it to everyone. Now that file someone is updating, sending it to someone. We are trying to coordinate. Everyone needs to know what each other is doing because my work depends on others. Others work depends on me. 
we are not having a meeting every day to sync. So how do I keep everyone in sync? I send a mail to everyone daily update. So every day I send a mail with 14 people in CC. Very good. Then what happens? The other 14 people are also <laughs> trying to do that. So 14 multiplied by 14 and then we have three months and we have 18 working days. We have 10,000 mails flowing. Does this look efficient? No. I'm going to get so many mails about the same project. I am attempting to keep everyone in sync, but these mails are going to get scattered in my inbox. In fact, I am a part of multiple projects. This is just one project. So I'm going to get thousands of mails per project plus my regular email. So basically I'm drowning in emails. What is the problem? Inefficiency, of course. Everyone knows this is inefficient, but we just live with it because we got used to it. Same story repeating all over again. Now you know the solution root cause. Root cause is what there are multiple projects. They should remain separate. They should not get mixed up in a dumping ground called inbox. So what do we do? One project needs a separate place, whether it is people or team. The discussion they do about it, files, everything should be in one place. That is the other role teams plays. So what do we do in teams? When you have a new project, you create a team. I'm not going to show you a live demo because that consumes more bandwidth. I'm going to just show you some screenshots. Probably you already know them, but still. So teams has two primary things. This chat is for ad hoc work and teams is for project specific works and meetings including live events happens from here. Plus Teams has a very sophisticated phone system. <coughs> you can have calls, you can have voicemails, voicemails get transcripted to text automatically and so on. But let's go about uh, learning the Teams creation part because that is something you should try. So what happens is when I have a new project, what do I do? I create a team. How do I create a team? I go to team, create a team, go to teams, say new team, and then add people to it. Once I add people to it, I can chat with them, but this is not chat. Chat is separate. It's called conversations. It's like a single threaded discussion group. So if you have a question, you should reply to the question rather than typing a chat kind of thing. Don't say reply, don't say chat, say reply. So each discussion thread becomes separate. So notice when the laptops will be delivered is a separate discussion and this is about configuration, which is a separate discussion. So this discipline has to come. Then it is important to understand and then differentiate between chat and teams. Now it is like chat, but better. Not only that, once we add people, we can give them different rights. We can and we should be able to add external parties as well. Nothing is going to inbox in this whole situation. That is where you start eliminating misuse of Outlook. So when it comes to this particular project, I am not going to send a mail with CC to 14 people at all. The only thing I have to do is those 14 people I want on my side, so I will start using teams. I will may do maybe do a mini training for them. Convince everyone it's good for everyone. Only then teams will practically be usable. So what happens in teams stays in teams. Now the best part is when a new person joins the team, you don't have to explain everything to them. Everything is available to people. You also have at the rate mentions and you will only get notice or notification for at the rate mentions. The notifications are designed with minimizing irritation in mind. All notifications are off by default. The only one which is on by default is when you are explicitly called out as a at the rate notification. So that's how Teams works. Now when it comes to tasks, because a project will have tasks, what do we do? We go to Teams. Teams has a plus sign, which is a very powerful tool there. When you click on that plus sign, let me try to see if I have a screenshot of that. It gives you many, many options. 
many options showing you what can you add to teams. So multiple Microsoft as well as non Microsoft tools can be added in teams and one of such tools which you can add is called planner. Planner means a shared task list, so you can create buckets there. This automatic will appear on your to do app on mobile as well. And uh, if you want, you can create categories or buckets. If you are doing development, one bucket could be backlog, others could be sprints. If you are having a Kanban board kind of thing, you can see group by progress or you can see a dashboard like this, which is automatically converted graphically. Now the best part is many customers want a Kanban board. No problem. You just go and say group by progress. You get a Kanban board. Many of us are used to having a weekly meeting or something like that. Now all this status plus all the discussion is visible to all team members at all times. So it's not going to make those review meetings simpler. It is going to eliminate waste of time in conducting unnecessary random review meetings. That is digital transformation. It eliminates misuse and creates time which you can now invest in doing some value added activity which will help you exceed your JD and grow faster. So that is about planner. Similarly, you have minutes of meetings. Now what happens in teams when you do minutes of meetings? How do you create a meeting? Just create a meeting, add it, people join. It's like any other meeting you are used to. Of course, there is blur background and re replacement of background, all that. One of the nice features it has is called meeting notes. So you just say record. In Skype also there was recording, but that recording was pathetic. You had to re-render it using link recording manager and it still gave poor quality. Finally, the recording would be available on your desktop. You still have to figure out how to share it with people. Those are large files. So now what happens? Remember there is stream. So when you record a meeting in Teams, the recording automatically goes to stream. Anybody who did not attend the meeting will get the entry point in Teams discussion itself, so they don't have to go to stream. When they click on it, it will start playing in stream. Now, assuming you are using English language and you have set the language, that's one extra step you have to do. As soon as the file is uploaded to stream, which happens automatically, you just have to set the language to English. If you do that, it automatically generates the transcript. Now this is the important thing. As an IT person, you'll be happy by saying, oh, it generates a transcript. That's not enough. You have to translate it into a language of business, something which users will understand. You have to promote this feature that automatic minutes of meeting and tell people, even if you write down minutes of meeting yourself, you'll never be able to write down every word. And if you forgot to write something, later on it can get disputed. Many of you are techies. You go to users and ask them their requirements. You can't write down everything. You may take an audio, but who is going to transcribe it? So now this audio is auto transcribed. Of course, YouTube also does that, but YouTube doesn't allow you to search. Now it allows you to search across the transcript. That's the benefit. Going one step further while we are on stream, let me explain stream as well. Stream integrates with forms because very often stream should be the place where all your LMS or learning and development videos should go. Typically they are lying in some LMS system which is using database blobs to store videos or you are using file shares or you are using SharePoint. You should not store database or file based videos. You should store videos on a streaming server which is stream. So assuming you put your learning material on stream, the HR guys will want to do testing. Now test or quiz can be created in forms. <coughs> and these two products talk to each other. So there is an interactivity tab where you can add a quiz at a particular point of time. You can add multiple quizzes. 
the video will pause. You can attempt the quiz and you will get the data about it. The third and AI based feature is if your video has people in it. For example, this is a very famous video. Two interviewers and two people. Now the transcript is there, but if I want to listen to what Bill Gates said, in the transcript, the word Bill Gates doesn't appear. It's what Bill Gates said. So how do I find where Bill Gates spoke? So that is beautifully done because it creates a, by applying cognitive AI face recognition. It identifies unique faces and creates a timeline by putting two and two together. So if I want to know Bill Gates, I click there. If I want to listen to Steve Jobs, I click there and so on. In fact, even if there's a crowd, it gives me a large set of faces. Of course, if they're irrelevant, you can hide them or if they're multi camera setups, you can have two angles of the same person. You can select and say merge as well. So very sophisticated and very nice implementation. Practical use of AI. So that is how Teams fits into the picture. Now there is another animal called Yammer. While we are at it, let me just explain. In fact, let me just show you the benefits of using Teams. Like we saw 12 benefits of OneDrive, there are lots of benefits of using Teams. May not have covered all of them one by one, but let me at least summarize them. So here it is. There are a couple of questions which are based on Teams. One is file shares in Teams versus file shares on OneDrive. Will the files uploaded to Teams have more benefits? OK, very good question. So let me explain what happens is when you have created a Teams for a team for a project. Now we have a problem. What did I talk about earlier? I told you what is the standard operating procedure now? Whenever I have a file, ideally I should store it on OneDrive. You just convinced all your users for that. Then you taught them teams. Now they are confused. Where should I store the file? So the standard operating procedure is wrong. When you have a file, new file, you shouldn't always store it on OneDrive. Think, is this file related to a particular project? Do you have a team for that in Teams? Then don't store it on OneDrive. Why? Because that's stupid. If you store it on OneDrive, how many people can see it? One. I'll have to manually share it with 14. No, no, no. So what I need is while I am in a file, I should be able to save the file directly to Teams. So in Teams, there is a tab called Files. You can create a new file there also. You can upload a file there also. But now I created a new file. Now what do I do? I am in Excel. So remember there is sites. Sites means teams. Microsoft has made a mistake. By calling it sites. It has been there because of SharePoint, but now that teams is more important. It should be called team slash sites. I don't know why Microsoft is not doing it. That request is pending for a long time. Never mind sites gives you a list of all your teams. So you go to a team and from here you can create subfolders in teams. Those are called channels in teams and then you store the file directly in teams. So teams as a structure, main project and multiple channels. How many channels you create depends on your requirements. So each channel can have a discussion tab, files tab, task tab and many, many other tabs. That's how it works. All right, any other questions? Next question is in teams. Can we have videos of all attendees and whoever speaks his or her video will come in focus uh, similar to Zoom? Yes, that is already there. Now I think five by three by three or seven by seven video is also now added recently and whoever speaks comes into focus. Yes. Next question is by Abhishek Kant. I get the OneDrive used for a single user and just like Dropbox, can we get multiple team members to synchronize the same folder? 
Absolutely. Very good question. So what you need to do is go to Teams. Like OneDrive allows you synchronization. It's a good idea to synchronize your project specific files as well. So let me see if I can show it to you. Just give me a minute. These are multiple projects which I'm a part of. I have a tab called files which has all the files and there is a sync button. The moment you click on the sync button, it finally uses the OneDrive infrastructure itself. It will create a separate folder. Under that separate folder, it will create a separate folder for this team and it will synchronize. Having said that, do not click on this sync button. What you do and notice that there are multiple channels and each channel can have its own files. So why am I saying don't click on this sync button? Because it will only sync this folder. What I ideally want is all these folders should be synced. One extra step required. Open in SharePoint. Go to SharePoint, then it will still open the same folder. All these folders are in a document library, so just go one level up to the base document library and then say sync. So bottom line, when you create a team, nothing new is happening. It's just creating a delivery list in exchange and a SharePoint group and orchestrating the whole jugglery so that users are empowered and they don't have to talk to IT, which keeps on troubling them. That is how teamwork becomes democratized. OK, any other questions? Next question is what is video with blur? Video with blur. <laughs> OK, so when you have video, all the tools nowadays provide it because you are sitting at home. You don't want people to see where you are sitting or even if you are sitting in office, there is a security issue. Many people have a whiteboard behind and if you are not careful, something confidential written on the whiteboard can leak out and this is the commonest way in which vendors come to know about your secrets. So irrespective of what you are doing, it's a good idea to get rid of your background. So if you are using video, there's a small little feature which says blur my background and now you can replace it with another picture, some standard pictures or you can put your custom pictures as well. How does it work? The video stream goes live to Azure Media Services. It analyzes each frame at 24 frames per second, finds out where is the person, where is non-person and blurs the non-human objects. This is happening live. So of course, if you say blur background, it's going to require little extra back uh, bandwidth because blurring cannot happen locally. Any Next other? question. Yeah. Is there any specific Microsoft Teams feature that can be taught to a 50 year old college lecturer about taking their classes for non techies? Yeah, I think I have answered that question already. Uh, simplest thing is for all lectures, people take notes. All lectures, people may ask you questions because they did not take notes. So if you use Teams and record every lecture, for example, then People can look at those recordings. There is transcript which is searchable, so even teacher may be able to search what they said. The course content can be a part of the files area. Minutes of meeting can be put on a shared OneNote notebook. And if you have an academic edition of Teams and OneNote, even the class workbooks and many other very specific features for teachers and students are enabled. So if there is a teacher involved, talk to someone in Microsoft and give them a demo of student and teacher edition of Teams and OneNote. They will never go back to anything else. All right, so I guess uh, yeah, I have occurred you enough, so let's summarize. Because there are so many tools, finally a question is going to come, which tool to use when? So let's focus on that and also focus a little on how to make so many users learn so many features in an effective manner. So let's answer the first question. Which tool to use when? Because when you have too many tools, it is confusing. Absolutely correct. Now, how do we solve that problem? 
Just give me a second. So where to store files? My files go to OneDrive. Project specific files go to Teams. Remember chat files automatically go to OneDrive. Departmental files typically or traditionally go to SharePoint, but here is another use case for Teams. Many of you still have file shares. Instead of moving them to SharePoint, move them to Teams because it has all the benefits of SharePoint plus the simplicity of Teams. Not only simplicity, when there is a departmental set of files, people are not just using files. They want to sync the files. It's easier from Teams. They want to discuss about those files. Again, it is easier. Departments have meetings also. Again, that is better managed in Teams. Doing that in SharePoint is much more complex. Then I may have project related files. So if you are using MS project online, it automatically creates a SharePoint site and project central can be added in Teams. And finally videos go to stream. So which product to use when each one has its own use case. Similarly now for teamwork, which product to use when? Let's see that. Multiple products, it becomes confusing. So let's see how to reduce that confusion and make people understand which product to use when, when I'm talking to more than one person at a time. Now you have to think, is this work ad hoc or not? Or is it teamwork or a common project? Now when I say create a team for a project, I don't necessarily mean it has to be a formal, formal project. What I mean is same set of people are talking to each other with a common goal. So even a simple repetitive thing like a monthly review can also be a candidate for creating a separate team. Same people, continued discussion and ongoing common goal. There is a third category of teamwork where there is no common goal, but there is a group of people. And fourth one, is formal projects where we have tasks which are linked to each other. So let's see one by one. Now ad hoc work comes in two categories. One is not urgent and one is which is urgent. So if the work is ad hoc, not urgent, then you use Outlook. Now remember I told you when not to use Outlook. So this is the only practical use case left for Outlook in today's world. Ad hoc non urgent work. Of course, Outlook is also useful for task. My task as we saw. Then if it is urgent work, you use Teams chat urgent official work. If it's teamwork, you create a Teams and put planner for shared task list. The discussion about the project happens again in Teams, but not using chat using conversations. Now I have a different use case. Let's say I have a draft of a new policy I'm creating. I want to show that policy to everyone in the organization because it affects everyone. And uh, let's say I'm revising salaries because of Corona. I don't want to take a one sided decision. I have a file that file is on one drive. I can't share the file with 1000 people. I don't want to send a mail with CC to 1000 people. I don't want to create a team with 1000 people in it. So now how do I do that kind of collaboration? It's an open ended democratic activity, but it's a short term activity. There is no long term common goal. So that is where non urgent things can be done using Yammer. So Yammer not a long term common goal, not a hard coded set of specific team members. Everyone involved that kind of thing is Yammer. So I put a link to my OneDrive file in Yammer give access to all authenticated users read only. They can like share, discuss, debate, fight there. Then I finalize the document. Same way someone did something good. I want to praise them in front of everyone. Instead of putting a small little message on internet which disappears tomorrow, I put it on Yammer. It's like a Facebook wall. So that's Yammer. If it's urgent work in a group, especially people not from your uh, active directory like uh, feet on street outsourced vendors, then Kaizala is another one, but now Kaizala is supposedly merging with teams. And finally, link tasks nobody else gives project or a similar tool, and those go into project. So again, which tool to use when? 
So that is how you get some sanity out of this apparent madness. This there is a method to the madness. You understand the needs and then you map the need to the right set of features. So finally, I'm going to take about few minutes to talk about the commonest mistake IT guys do, which prevents people from using Office effectively. On efficiency365.com, my blog, there's an article on each one of them. One common mistake is phase release. So IT guy says first phase is OneDrive, second phase is Teams. That comes after six months. Now, why are people doing it that way? Because it's convenient for IT. Because it is the most pitiable way of deployment. Because deployment is already there. You are just not telling people you have all the tools. Doing it in phases is OK, but do it in phases in such a way that you take a small group of people, give them the whole platform, teach them, then go to another group, then go to another larger group. Phases like that are better than product wise phases because the whole platform is designed to be used in an integrated manner. The most important practically is CXOs. The bosses don't know the power of the platform. They are signing the check, but they don't know. If they don't know, they are not going to help you. So please teach bosses. If boss is inefficient, everyone is inefficient. Once boss is efficient, they will not only sign the check with more happiness, they will actually actively help you in propagating adoption. They will help you in sending SOPs. They'll help you making rules. So I'm not going to talk about all these, but just get the idea. Maybe if you have specific question, you can ask later. Finally, when it comes to adoption, I'm sure you have heard of the jargon called uh, change management. Change management itself is a consultant like topic. There are many methods of change management. I'm not going to go into those. There are five steps which work. This is the practical method I have evolved. First step is to get bosses attention. Then boss will say teach everyone. Then you do mass sessions to create awareness, but creating awareness doesn't change the habit. So you create standard operating procedures, release them through boss, and then you can go deeper into individual activities of people, look at business level use cases and say how I can mix and match different components from the platform and then put it together. For example, you can see someone is doing a survey looking at the results. If the results are poor, sending a thank you mail or a sorry mail, that is a power automate scenario like that. That's office process reengineering. And finally, you need a team which is actively spending at least two, three hours every week looking at features proactively and then converting them to benefits because as technical people, we have been told what? We have been told there is a use case and then you find or create the solution. Office is different. Office has thousands of solutions. Unfortunately, we don't look at them. We only look at the buttons we know, those 150 misused ones, and the others we just ignore saying this is too advanced. That is not advanced. Those are solutions to your needs. Microsoft knows your needs more than you do because they are dealing with 1 billion inefficient people for 30 years. So your thought process should be, I should not ignore the features. I should explore them and discover the benefits behind features. So this is the process that champions team should do. So what do they do? They explore proactively, learn, then go back to business. They should be from business only. Then find the application, share it with the potential beneficiaries, and then everyone grows faster. So that is how the platform can help you grow faster. So that's all I have time for. If you have questions, I will take questions now. In First the question is. Yeah, hold on, yes. In the meantime, if you have patience. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Teams doesn't have a live transcript. PowerPoint has a live transcript because stream is not used for this kind of live presentations. Uh, PowerPoint is typically, even if I'm doing a live stream, which basically uses 
the stream infrastructure, what am I presenting using? I am presenting using PowerPoint in most cases. So PowerPoint does have a live stream feature. How many questions are pending? Yes. Uh, six. OK, Four so let's, more actually. OK, so let's go through the questions. If time permits, I will try to show a live demo of. Live captions in up to 60 different languages using PowerPoint. Next question. Next question is, is there an API for getting a live transcript in streams? Yes, of course there is an API. And once the live, tra live transcript itself gets created automatically, you just invoke it by putting the correct language. Once the transcript is created, you can download it as a VTT file also. So if you are a heavy YouTuber, this is the fastest way of getting transcripts automatically. Before you upload the file to YouTube, also upload it to stream, get the transcript. There's an edit feature also, clean the transcript, get the VTT file, upload the same video to YouTube, upload the VTT, you're done. Next. Next question is, can we add the Teams call to a live call to do the recording transcribing? Now repeat the question, sorry. Can we add a Teams call to a live call to do the recording transcribing? So I'm assuming can we do a recording of a Teams meeting while I'm doing a Teams live broadcast? No. Having said that, Teams can handle multiple simultaneous meetings. One of the use cases is all of you are used to so many technical events. Recently there was MVP summit. Some of you may have attended. We had some 300 meetings or 300 live so meetings happening, not live broadcast meetings, simultaneous tracks. So you could go and connect to seven, eight meetings at the same time and you can jump between meetings very quickly. That is possible, but you can't mix meetings with live streaming. Now if I start a meeting, the live streaming cannot be paused. So live stream has one important thing. It is live. So once you go live, you can't pause it. You can only end it. OK, next, next question one. is. Can, is there a way to integrate to do listing in Teams? Yeah, absolutely. Teams is very soon going to get a tab called tasks, which basically shows you the task app contents in Teams. So actually what is happening is the to do app is not just for Outlook tasks. Let me try to show you that slide so it becomes easier. Give me a minute. So the to do app, as I have told you earlier, what does it show me? Now you'll understand it better. These are tasks coming from Outlook. We still have a bad habit of flagging mails. No problem. Those are also shown. I have planner shared task list across different projects. Those are also shown. Then for micromanagement, daily planning, you can put up, pick up a task from any of these and plan my day. So that's another thing. These are separate lists I have created for my own work. They also automatically sync with Outlook. So basically, wherever a task originates across the Microsoft platform, to do app is becoming the aggregator, so to say. So in order, because it is becoming an important app and very soon project tasks will also appear here. So very soon inside Teams, you will have a to do app tab where all this will be visible. OK, next. I have not worked on Power Apps. How is it different? That's all the question is. So I'm going to answer that question, but while I'm answering that question, let me also show you the transcript feature. So let me get the correct slide first. Now, suppose I was talking to an audience who doesn't understand English. I want to show them live subtitles, so I can go to subtitles settings. What do I do? I choose the language in which I am going to speak. It understands Indian accent. There are these many languages for the speaker. 
Now I want to choose which language it should be translated in. Now I don't know which languages all of you are from. I'm just going to take Hindi because hopefully all of you understand that. But remember this is a much longer list 65 languages and this is going to increase already. Multiple Indian languages are there. Bangla is there. Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, all of them. Smaller. Now. I have set spoken language. Subtitle language. Now there's another tool coming which is in beta right now, which is an app called PowerPoint Live, which if you have a multilingual audience, then you can give the app to them. When you start the PowerPoint presentation, you can display a QR code which PowerPoint will give you. Everyone scans the code. Now they can see the PPT on their screen, but more importantly, they can choose their language from one of the 65 and whatever you are speaking in English will get tra live translated to any of those multiple languages parallelly. So anyway, to cut a long story short, I have set subtitles. Now I'm going to start subtitles. So now what is happening? Whatever I'm speaking is hopefully going to. Cognitive services and it is getting translated live. So now while that is happening, let me try to explain what is Power Platform. Power Platform contains three products Power Automate for automatic workflow automation, Power Apps for creating apps, and Power BI for analytics. Quickly, I will tell you how this works. Now notice the PowerPoint presentation is overlapping on that. So what do I do? When I have subtitle settings, I can also choose whether it is overlap or not overlap. So I'm going to below slide now, so the slide area will reduce so that there is no overlap. So how does workflow work? There is a trigger and multiple actions. You know IFTTT kind of tools. Any kind of workflow system is going to work on trigger and actions. So the best part is this flow is already monitoring triggers in all the tools which we saw. So it's pre-integrated. We just have to choose the right trigger and the right set of actions. So even users with little bit of training can automate their repetitive work. Multiple types of typical trigger action is called automatic. On demand means you just create a button and click on it. Then whatever you have said as actions will happen. One common thing is approvals, serial, parallel. If you have used uh, SharePoint designer, something similar. This integrates with not just SharePoint because earlier all the work workflow approvals used to happen only in SharePoint. Now it works with OneDrive, works with all the other tools. So trigger can be in all other tools. And then more sophisticated business processes. There are lots of templates to choose from. You learn by using a template, understanding how it is designed and then go further. Similarly, Power Apps is a method of creating low code, zero code applications. So what does it do? Zero programming. You install the Power Apps app and then on top of that Power Apps app, your applications are going to run. So there's no compilation and redistribution. So Power App app on your end user mobile is like your corporate app store. So you create an app and give it. Two types of apps. There are model apps where you start with a blank canvas connect to a data source or there are other types of apps which work with CDS if you have dynamics. And then there are forms and then there is Power BI for analytics. So that all these three put together is the Power Platform. Next question is in large projects, how can Microsoft project planner and teams come together? How do we track and sync in a dashboard? Project planner and teams. OK, so in large projects, what happens? You will typically have the project in MPP format. 
Now, if you have MPP, of course you can upload the MPP file in Teams. It's any other file. But if you are really doing multiple projects and serious project management, you don't want to waste time copy pasting. You should seriously think of going to project online where instead of storing MPP files, you upload them to project server, which is pre integrated. No configuration to be done and projects get consolidated automatically. In which case what will happen? You will get a single dashboard for PMO or bosses where they can see across projects what is happening, how the resource utilization is, how budgets versus actual, what is the variance, what are the delays and so on without people in project management doing any copy paste at all. Now that dashboard itself can be added as a tab in Teams. <coughs> when it's come to planner, planner allows you to create shared tasks. Those are not project tasks. Planner shared tasks are flat. They are not linked to each other. So why would a project manager use planner? Because there are some tasks which are related to the project, but they are not part of an MPP. They are ancillary satellite tasks. Or as a project manager, I am also managing some projects without project. There you can use planner. There is no direct integration between project and planner. Next question is, can we integrate multiple accounts into to do such as personal client employer typical IT person scenario? Absolutely. And if you have MDM and MM, there is automatic segregation between them. So a task from corporate cannot be copy pasted to personaloutlook.com. No more questions as of now. What is Manas saying? Manas is saying that one of the best features is your month in a review for Office 365. It shows with whom you have collaborated and how much time spent. Shows focus, collaboration and quiet days. Yeah, so that's another benefit of integrated AI. So while all of you are programming on AI, Microsoft is not setting quiet. Obviously, Microsoft gives you the infrastructure for AI, but Microsoft is actively using AI inside all the Office products because who is the biggest beneficiary of AI? The product with the highest installed base, 1.6 billion people use Office. So I don't have time to tell you everything, but every Microsoft product on Office platform has AI built in. Like Manas has rightly said, you get a mail, at least look at it if you have my analytics. If you create a new mail or you open an existing mail, you will see a button nowadays called my analytics. Please click there. It is using Microsoft Graph API to analyze how you are using Outlook, how much meetings, how much time outside office hours, where were you, how many meetings in person, how many online. It is integrating all that data and giving you actionable insights. So if you have not seen that, use it. It's a very nice practical use of AI. And lastly, all these sessions, not just this one, but the earlier 15 ones were possible because of my team. Shesham who has been with me for, I don't know, 18 years now. Anindo, probably all of you know, a long lasting friend. And Zeus, whom I'm grooming to take over from me very soon. So that's it. Thank you. And goodbye. Take care.